hope so. Um, okay, sounds good. Um, I'm David. Um, I hack on everything. Uh, well, I think it's fun. I don't do anything as work. So um, today I'm talking about DRM security. I worked with Dave early on the um, DRM render node stuff uh, as Google Sum of Code. And it's actually a split talk. I first want to talk about some DRM security stuff and then want to talk about um, which is and session management. <coughs> uh, we heard last year a talk from Martin Perez. Um, I forgot exactly um, about <laughs> um, the security on the graphics <laughs> stack on general on Linux. And I want to continue that. I worked uh, on fixing most of these bugs that we had there. Uh, but I also think that talking about security can be quite boring. Um, so I want to instead do a walkthrough through the DRM API, how we use it today, how we do the generic API stuff, and just mention why we're um, on it, um, what problems we have today. Um, so today the API is basically split into two systems. We have the rendering part and we have the node setting part. Um, both are on the same uh, character device which brings a lot of problems. Um, the rendering uses the DRM API and it's highly driver specific. There's almost nothing which is driver generic. And the other part, the mode setting API is uh, generic. We have KMS. Western, for instance, doesn't use any driver specifics for mode setting. And the connection between both is just buffer passing. So we do stuff on buffers, on pictures, on images with the rendering API. Once we're done, we pass it on to the mode setting to display it. But this is the only connection we have between these both. We had, uh, during Plumbers, um, the idea to allow passing it back to the, use the 2D, uh, 2D pipeline to render images, but we don't have that upstream yet. Um, so the first thing we do if you want to use the rendering API of DRM is basically you open the card. Today we use UDEF to get card uh, nodes, but for this target, we just ignore that and just assume we open the flash dev slash CI slash card zero. And this doesn't give us anything except an open file descriptor because for DRM, we need multi uh, multiple authentication mechanisms to really make use of the API. The problem is we have multiple APIs on a single node, so we cannot allow just by opening the file, uh, we cannot give them any privilege. Um, because DRM authentication is quite complex, I want to skip that now and come back later and just assume once we open it, we are authenticated for now. So the first thing we want is buffer location. There are a lot of ways to get buffers. One way, the only generic way, um, is to use the dumb buffer allocation. So once we opened it, we have this create dumb buffer call, um, which returns us a file handle, uh, a buffer handle, and this handle is used to uh, access buffers. And of course, we can pass width, height, sprite information, and so on to the IOCTL, but that's just the, um, we can ignore it for now. And the handle is bound to the file descriptor, so that means only the one who owns the file descriptor can use the handle. If anyone else tries to use the handle, it will just fail. And once we got a handle, we of course want to get CPU access to render to the buffer, and then we use MMAP, of course. And the problem with MMAP is it requires a file descriptor to map. And in DRM, we use this kind of hack to pass a special offset to MMAP to allow mapping a specific buffer of this file descriptor. <coughs> and to get the offset, we cannot just pass the handle because the handle is just well, a random number, but we call DRM IOCL mode map dump. And this returns us a unique offset that we can pass to MMAP. This sounds quite simple and works, and everyone uses that for um, 2D uh, access to, uh, to CPU access for buffers. Um, but the problem with that is, is that offsets are globally um, accessible. And the thing, you can just guess the number that you get as an offset as another process and call it to MMAP and you get access to the buffer. Of course, we don't want that because buffers are normally private and you want to render it into it and don't want others to access it. Um, the reason why these are global are not very obvious because uh, it has to do with internal uh, VMA management with the kernel, and we cannot provide an inode for each open file handle, but it's, we only have one inode in DRM for the whole card. 
it simplifies um, unmapping of buffers and so on. So we cannot change that. So what we did in the kernel, oh, but first let's look at a <laughs> very simple exploit for that. Any user space process can just loop over the uh, integers and try to map it as an offset. And it doesn't need any handle access, it doesn't need anything. It just can call MF on a pointer script on the DRM node and we get access to the buffer. It's a bit harder than that because you need to get the size right, otherwise DRM complains a lot. Yeah, sure, but if you, yeah. Yeah, if you know the size, it can, then it works. Exactly, it can take what? Well, for TTM, I guess you can, I know that's that. For TTM, you can map into buffers, just gem requires the right size, but for TTM, you can also map subsizes. Okay. Um, but we fixed that um, the, since Linux 3.12, I guess. Um, this is no longer possible. What we did is very simple. We just require whenever you call MF that you have access to the buffer. So the kernel now tracks. If you call MF, it checks um, the offset you pass in. It tries to find the file, uh, file handle and the uh, uh, underlying buffer, and it checks whether you have a handle to that buffer. So. When you have a handle, you can MF it. If you don't have a handle, you can no longer do that. Um, yeah, so that's done now. Um, so this is now a, a quite easy way to use DRM to get uh, rendering into to, uh, to via CPU into buffers. And yeah, the 3.12, this works. <laughs> Um, of course, this breaks semantics slightly, so if you depend on this functionality, if you actually pass MF buffers in user space around, of course you can no longer map these. But no user space, well, not that I'm aware of that anyone did that. You just pass handles around. And so, yeah, this should work. And so once we have a buffer and know how to render into it, we still have the problem we want to display it or we want to share it. What we currently do is we pass buffers to a display server which can display it. Um, the important thing is, if we come back to the buffer creation, is the handle. So the handle is always a way to tell someone they have access to a buffer. So we want, once we have a buffer and a handle, we want the display server to also get a handle. Um, a API available, available for that is uh, GemFlink. Um, again, with GemFlink, it's a simple IOC we call, and it returns, for a handle that we have, it returns a 32-bit number, which is a unique name, but it's just a number. So you can pass this number over any socket, or you can write it down, and insert it again in another application, and it can call it gem open, and it will get a handle for the buffer. So it's a globally unique name that's also globally accessible. That's, of course, the same pro problem as for the MFs, and it's even easier to do, so you can, the same um, way to exploit this is to just go in a loop, gem open. And actually, the names are not randomized in the kernel, so they are sequential, so it's very easy to do that. It's like you get the first 10 buffers by just trying it 10 times. And once you get a handle, of course, you can hammer it. You can do anything with it. Um, we cannot fix that, because that's the assumption of DRI2. DRI2 says once you are authenticated <coughs> to DRM, you're allowed to access any global buffer. And so what we just do is to make this deprecate, uh, to deprecate this. So we don't want user space to use that anymore, especially for DRI3 or for Wayland. We have other mechanisms to do that. And what we use is actually DMA buff. Um, DMAbuff can do a lot more than just passing buffers around. But for this, I want to concentrate on the passing um, yeah, passing functionality. What you do with uh, DMAbuff is basically the same with JMFLink. You just call a prime handle to FD, but instead of a name, you get a file descriptor now. So you pass this file descriptor over a Unix socket. And it's important that file descriptors are always bound to a process, so no one else can access this, only the one who receives it to get the file descriptor, a copy of the file descriptor. And they can then call prime fd2 handle. You don't even have to change the code that much because um, it's still just an integer. The only um, <laughs> hard thing to do is file descriptor parsing. And x didn't, x didn't do that, so that can be quite heavy to change. <laughs> but I guess that's what the arrive 3 Fix does. Down. Well. Yeah. Um, 
though it's not really more complex, but it adds another layer. You could just change the whole DRM API to use file descriptors of DMA buff buffers instead of gem handles, but this was, would change a lot of stuff, and so we didn't do that yet, so you, you get this extra layer. You cannot just pass gem handles. But I think that's fine, because it's really not that much code. Um, so now we know how to uh, share buffers, how to render into buffers, and how to create buffers. Destroying buffers is also easy, it's just one call. Um, but we still have the problem with authentication. If you open a card, you don't get any access, as I said earlier. Um, instead, we have a facility called getMagic and AuthenticateMagic. A client calls getMagic on a, on a uh, DRM file descriptor, and again, gives just any random magic number and passes this on to an X server or to Wayland, uh, Western, or any other DRM master. And this uh, graphics server then authenticates this magic number, and internally, internally DRM notices which file descriptor is uh, connected to that and allows it to do any rendering. What we notice uh, here is that we require a running graphics server to get access to any DRM functionality. So we cannot do GP GPU, we cannot do off-screen rendering without a running X server, which is actually quite bad because not everyone does that. Especially on a server, you need um, a running X server to do GPU acceleration. And um, what we did with uh, the 3.12 kernel is to just make this um, obsolete. We don't use that anymore. Instead, we provide uh, render nodes now. Um, the reason for that is that access management on Linux is usually always done via file system. And this is important, we don't invent our own uh, authentication mechanisms, we just reuse file systems. Because on a file system, user space has fine-grained access, they can set ACLs, they can set uh, group, groups and users and access modes, and we don't want to repeat all that stuff in DRM again. Um, furthermore, there's a reason that file descriptor passing is called SEM writes. We pass, uh, pass writes to another process by passing file descriptors. We don't pass magic numbers, we don't pass any integers. File descriptor passing is safe, so we should actually make use of that. And what we now do is we provide with a new kernel render nodes. Render nodes can be accessed. Instead of card zero, you use render D128. Um, the most important thing about render nodes is to see that you're automatically authenticated and you get a lot less privilege to do on that node. So on render nodes, you're not allowed to use gem uplink because if you said gem uplink is not really safe, you use DMA buffs. On render nodes, you cannot use any authentication because you're already authenticated. You have no mode setting access because mode setting has global resources and we cannot allow any access to global resources to unprivileged clients. You cannot do, yeah. No global resource access, you cannot do any legacy DRM, so DRI won't, won't work on that, and you cannot become DRM master on render nodes. Um, so the only thing that is left is really rendering, and rendering is always, well, has to be tied to an open file context. So you cannot, if any client opens a render node, anything that it does should not affect any other client. <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> if done properly, it's doable. And with uh, <laughs> command stream parsing or validation, we can try to do that. But especially with uh, GPU context, this will work. And just one example, I did now show how to do CPU access. This is a short example of how you can, with render nodes, how you can get OpenGL context. And this is really simple. You need no X X11, you need no Wayland, you need nothing. You just open the node. And then you use GBM, with a, uh, which is a MISO library, um, to create a device and call EGL get display. Some boilerplate code can initialize EGL and pass your constraint. And then you already can create a context and make it current. And once you've done this, you haven't created any frame buffer, but, but you already got a G, uh, open GL context. You can create textures now, you can initialize all the stuff you want. The only thing missing is, of course, frame buffer creation, so your rendering pipeline will work. And this is done via GPM uh, surface create, then you create your EGL window surface and make it current. Question? Yes? If, if a new client gets uh, open a render node like that to begin rendering, while the X server is currently here in an master, does, that, does the client need to still gain magic authentication? Is that completely sufficient for the client when the X server is currently master? You don't 
don't need to be master. You don't need to do anything to do all that, what I just mentioned. Your real master is solely for um, mode setting or similar stuff. Well, but I'm not asking if the client needs to become master. Yeah. I'm asking if, if the X server is currently running as master, yeah. does a client that wishes to render in that fashion, yeah. does it still need to gain? No, it does not need to talk to the, it doesn't care for the X server. That's great. It, this works without X server running, or and with it running, of and course. Running. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of course, and this is actually a lot of that is caused just into the GRI two hooks in MISA, uh, which we already do for our current rendering. This is just a way to do it without talking to an X server. Um, so the underlying work for MISA is already in place, I guess, since several several years now. And yeah, okay. So it's now pretty easy to get um, OpenGL and frame buffers <coughs> without any working um, uh, any running X server. I already think this is pretty nice because we no, any, uh, no longer depend really on any graphics server running. Yeah. Just a uh, semantic question about the last slide. You yeah. had um, create window surface. Why is that create window surface? And I mean, I understand why it might not be create fixed map because those are oh. single buffers. But what, like, what's the difference between a window and a p buffer here? Why, you know, is a window something that some other Windows system can get access to, or is it no. just create uh, create uh, opaque surface or, or okay? What, surface? what we have here is um, EGL has is basically a wrapper around the window system. No, I, I, I'm, yeah. familiar, I'm familiar with EGL. I'm wondering what the semantics of calling yes, that a window yes. surface are. As but to um, the okay. underlying, uh, underlying system that we use for DRM means a window is just a full screen frame buffer that you render into. So okay. you don't have these, yeah? So I, I would say that the, for the key buffer, you said you don't have any window system that can call it through anything and have deep down to all that stuff. But the window, the EGL, is something that has a window system trying to think that you can see or see or something. I think it's created from the window to make the window system and the buffer system. the render node name with a particular DRI node, a particular um, um, well, the existing is DRI node. First of all, to, uh, you mean now in user space? How to yeah, yeah. G given a dev DRI card zero, how do I find out what the associated render node, na node name you is? Just add 128 <coughs> to the name. It's always the offset 128. The card on the render node, it's actually a kernel internal. Oh, 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 oh because you're just using the minor number. Exactly. Oh, but I did a patch for LeapDRM for that, and I was actually, I don't think I added 128. That was something a bit deeper than that. But the code is uh, available. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, because in DRI 3, I can just switch from using dev DRI card 0 to using render node today. Yeah. That's the point. Uh, there may be MISA code which uses legacy IR calls. We have to check all that, but um, not at DRI three. Yeah, yeah. sure. I'd be surprised if any existing parameters. I mean, most of the a lot of the DRI one APIs just went away with the DRI one yeah. driver. Yeah. And just as in this EGL create window surface wasn't available. Uh, well, for long, um, what we did earlier was just uh, call the jump buffer uh, allocation, mm -hmm. and then we called. Uh, GL frame buffer, what is it? GL frame buffer create, render buffer, and so on. So we did this all in OpenGL, so this is just a wrap up on that. Um, okay, 
So this is all about the client side. We have the work, uh, client side working now without any uh, X server running. And now we also still have the problem with the DRM master. Um, the short explanation about the DRM, DRM master is if multiple traffic server open the uh, DRM card, we want only one of them to be, uh, to be allowed to access uh, global resources and to access that KMS IOC ports. And we can switch uh, these by two IOCTLs that we have, which are called DRM set master and DRM drop master. But there are also two other ways to acquire and drop DRM master, which obviously is close, so it makes sense. And to acquire DRM master, it's enough to call open on the node if there's no other running DRM master. Um, Whose idea was that? <laughs> I actually don't know. The problem with, <laughs> with this thing is that we of course need to protect DRM set master. You don't want any client to call DRM set master. Um, so we make them root only. Um, this is again problematic because we cannot run uh, X server without root now. So what we basically did is we allow open, oops, uh, we allow open on the node if there's no running client and no running DRM server to get to gain root uh, to gain DRM master without being root. So only DRM set master is bound to being root. And <laughs> you cannot actually if you're not a uh, root and you open the node, you cannot actually call DRM drop master, but you may be DRM master. Um, <laughs> no race conditions here. No. <laughs> Seems legit. <laughs> And if you now uh, assume we have multiple traffic servers running and we, we T-switch between them, the active server has to call DRM drop master. Now you do the we T-switch and a new server calls DRM set master. But you have this sh short time frame in between where any client can open the node and become, uh, well, hijack the DRM master by just opening it. They don't need to be root. And so the new uh, traffic server coming up cannot display anything. And if this client even well, if we would drop the requirement for DRM drop master as root only, which doesn't make any sense. But it would pro protect against something else. If the client would then call DRM drop master, um, it would no longer be master. But if we know that any client which was master once is authenticated, this client got DRM authenticated without ever talking to a server. So we, if it calls, uh, opens the node in exactly the time span between a VT switch and drops DRM master again, which is switching with the word, but the client of that is authenticated. And this will go away once we remove this open nonsense where we can gain <laughs> DRM master. There are patches pending for that, but they are not yet extreme. The problem with the root only DRM set master and DRM, DRM drop master are not really well, harder to understand, and this is what I want to talk about uh, in the second half of this talk. And yeah, that's already it. Um, with Linux 3.12, we will get all this upstream. The render nodes are still marked as experimental and we need to enable them explicitly. But I hope with 3.13, we will finally get them. If there are any questions, just let me know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's the status of uh, being able to use the render nodes in Mesa? Is that going to require some extra patches, or is that work right now? <laughs> Uh, the question was whether we can use uh, Mesa with render nodes right now. Um, that uh, what I showed works, um, but if you want to use DRI, um, you still or DRI two, you still have this um, well, the protocol which is defined, which you cannot change. You still have this authentication stuff, and on render nodes we disabled any legacy API, so this will actually fail because the uh, um, X server will try to authenticate the client on the. Uh, or we'll try to get a magic number. <laughs> and it's, there are patch, patches from Martin um, which implement all that, they are not upstream yet. But once you don't use uh, uh, the X11 DRI2 or you use Wayland with a modified WL DRM extension, it will all work. You don't need real client changes. So I think, I think the question maybe was, is it possible to just run That works. Yeah, I think more from the perspective of running OpenGL. <coughs> oh yeah, uh, I just did OpenGL because I have no card at home that works with OpenCL, so I cannot test it. So 
that you're going to show us something that uh, really kind of flavor fly. But that should work as well. So, yeah, nothing flash. In the end, the only thing that changed is uh, do we require clients to authenticate or not? And then, uh, with the patches I made, it's very transparent for applications if uh, they need to. Uh, the, the way they access the card is uh, is the same. It's just do we need to authenticate or not? And I just had to add a, a field in the uh, uh, the CRI2 protocol to say, do I need to get authenticated or not? And then there are patches everywhere because of that. CRI2 proto, uh, X server, uh, every DDX, ECRM, and meter. But I guess if you What we basically did there is just splitting the two APIs that came with some DRM API and T2 nodes because this allows user space to apply ACLs, to apply um, file system nodes to them separately. So we don't need the authentication because we can do it via file system access right now. Oh, just one thing. Yeah. Uh, what you said about uh, random node being uh, the number being the number of the. Yeah. Uh, it's not true if all the drivers don't support it. If you yeah. have several cards and all that. So that's why I actually implemented something nice for that. So the HR. idea for that is just to change the kernel to just allocate the card numbers. And if someone, um, if, it, if, if a driver um, um, advertises random net support, you just um, in the kernel add 128 to the card number. You yeah. don't no longer allocate these uh, dynamic numbers. Yes. In the user space, if you, uh, for instance, you want to know, I open uh, card zero and what is the, the corresponding random node or the opposite, then uh, you need to make uh, yeah, a, a little use, dense and I can't can remember what it is. But to, or SysFS to just find out the minor and major oh. number. That works, of course. Okay. Okay. So uh, are, are the yeah. mode setting nodes, those still have all of the existing API for queuing rendering as well in yes. mode setting? We don't change um, the legacy nodes. Are we going to create a new mode setting only node? Um, that's something uh, that's not upstream we're still working on. Um, the problem for that is we need um, to allocate the, well, every graphics, graphics server needs to do rendering normally. At least it needs well, to I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking of cards that don't have that don't that, that have two separate physical devices, one for display and yeah. one for rendering. The problem with that is that we need to um, tell the render node if it allocates a frame buffer that it's possible to use a scanner buffer for the other card. Now right. you currently have no way to do that for DMA uh, DMA buffer. Also, that, this is that combined node would ostensibly know how to do that. Um, that's the reason why we still allow rendering on the legacy nodes. But once we got this. Like at the <coughs> IOM allocator from Android tries to solve that, and we talked about that at the Linux Plumbers conference. But this is not a stream, it requires a lot more work. So we still allow this allocation on the, the another node. Yeah. Um, 